फेसबुक पे आ गया It's 2 p.m. G. We have about 20 uh, registered participants. Uh, about 10 of them have joined. So I'm just waiting for a few more to join. Then, inshallah, we will start. Dr. Butalia is already here. Welcome, G. Dr. Riaz. Welcome, Sohail Kibria, and welcome, Rizwan Mirza. Doctor, welcome also. This is Rizwan, Mir Rizwan Mirza, Rizwan Mirza, Sohail Kibria, Dr. Riaz Akhtar. The three of them, they are the founder members of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers. Just an introduction for you. <clears throat> Dr. Riyaz, you met also when you were here in Lahore last week. It was very nice. You boss on us, you bet you didn't get to eat that for a little So he thank you for inviting me for dinner. You are always welcome. Inshallah, formally, I will start in, 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 in when we get two or three more participants, then inshallah, we will start. <clears throat> मैं जी इनफॉर्मली उर्दू में अनाउंसमेंट एक दफा करता हूं और वो ये है कि आप लोगों ने जिन्होंने सीपीडी की रजिस्ट्रेशन कराई हुई है सीपीडी के लिए आप लोगों ने अपने वेबकैम पे लाइव अपीयर होना है ये पाकिस्तान इंजीनियरिंग काउंसिल की एक उनके रूल्स में शामिल है तो इसमें किसी किस्म की रिलैक्सेशन नहीं दी जा सकती तो आप मेहरबानी करके जिन्होंने अपने कैम इस वक्त ऑन नहीं किए हुए प्लीज ऑन कर लें और ड्यूरिंग द लेक्चर मुझे ना अनाउंसमेंट करनी पड़े क्योंकि स्पीकर के फ्लो में फर्क पड़ता है बार बार डिस्टर्ब करने से तो काइंडली अपने कैंप ऑन कर लें जिन्होंने ऑन नहीं किए हुए और माइक्रोफोन आपने म्यूट पोजीशन पे रखना है जब स्पीकर साहब बात कर रहे हो थैंक यू ताहिर साहब आई एम प्लीज टू सी के भी कुछ अपने ओल्डर इंजीनियर्स भी है न्यू जनरेशन आल्सो हियर ये बहुत चंकी गल है कि तुम पी एस सी ने दोनों जो ओल्डर जनरेशन एंड न्यूर इंजीनियर है जो दोनों रुला के गीता इट इज वेरी नाइस टू सी थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब साड़ी कोशिश भी यही है कि अपना जरा यंग इंजीनियर है जरा फ्रेश है जरा जरा तीन तो चार साल का एक्सपीरियंस है टॉपिक्स भी उन्होंने हिसाब न होंगे ने स्पीकर भी उन्होंने हिसाब न होंगे ने ताकि उन्होंने मतलब सिर्फ लैक्चर फॉर द सेक ऑफ लैक्चर ना हो बाकी नॉलेज जी है इंपार्ट होनी चाहिए है और सीनियर इंजीनियर भी देखोगे गल आ जाएंगे सो एक मिक्सचर है मैं जी चैट बॉक्स के अंदर अपनी जो कांटेक्ट इनफॉरमेशन है वो मैं भेज देती है यू शुड ऑल बी एबल टू सी दैट दैट जी 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 चैट बॉक्स में जी बिल्कुल ये जी क्योंकि मैं प्रेजेंट कर रहा हूं और जिधर आप भी दे सवाल है ये जी तुसी ना चैट बॉक्स में कमेंट कर दे जाना लेकिन आई माइट नॉट हैव टाइम टू रिस्पोंड टू दोस लेकिन ताहिर साहब उन्होंने कोलेट कर दे रहे हैं कि अगर टुवर्ड्स द एंड ऑफ टाइम मिल गया टाइप करन दा तो मैं कर दूंगा जी तो पता है इंजीनियर सिंगल ट्रैक होंगे एक पास काम कर रहे हैं दूजे पास काम दिमाग साढ़े एक पास चल रहा है सोहेल साहब आप ही की हाल है जी दफ्तर बैठे हो जी सोहेल साहब जी असलाकुम डॉक्टर 
Tarun Jain Singh Bataliya Sahib, it is so much pleasure to see you around. You look very fresh and in a very pleasant mood, mashallah. It is a good thing. How did you get to the night? I got to the night. I got to the night. So, I got to the night in India and Pakistan. I got to the night in the morning, but I got to the night in the morning. It is nice. ਇਹ ਲੋ ਕਮਸ ਕਮ ਅਸੀਂ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਉੱਪਰਲਾ ਹਿੱਸਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਬਾਡੀ ਦਾ ਉਸ ਤੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਡਰੈਸ ਪਾ ਲਿਆ ਮੀਟਿੰਗ ਵਾਲਾ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਕੋਈ ਗੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਬਾਕੀ ਵੀ ਦਿਖਾ ਲੈਣਾ ਸਾਡੀ ਅਮਰੀਕਾ ਦੀ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਡਰੈਸ ਹੈਗੀ ਨਿੱਕਰ ਸਹੀ ਹੈ ਸਰ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਠੀਕ ਦਿਸ ਇਜ਼ ਅ ਮਾਰਨਿੰਗ ਟ੍ਰੈਕ ਡਰੈਸ ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਸੇ ਐਕਸਰਸਾਈਜ਼ ਡਰੈਸ ਨਹੀਂ ਨਿੱਕਰ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈਗੀ ਹੈ ਇਜ਼ ਅਮਰੀਕਨ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਡਰੈਸ ਗਰਮੀਆਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਹੀ ਹੈ ਇੱਥੇ ਤਾਂ ਸਰ ਟੈਂਪਰੇਚਰ ਕੀ ਹੈ हां जी वी आर अबाउट 6 मिनट्स 6 मिनट्स पास्ट 2 पीएम डॉक्टर साहब आई एम रियली ऑनर्ड टू टेल यू दैट वी हैव प्रोफेसर जियाउद्दीन हियर अमंग आवर पार्टिसिपेंट्स ही वाज आवर प्रोफेसर व्हेन वी एंटर्ड द यूनिवर्सिटी ही हैज रिटायर्ड नाउ वाओ वाओ ही वाज अ प्रोफेसर ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियरिंग इन यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग टेक्नोलॉजी लाहौर एंड व्हेन वी एंटर्ड द यूनिवर्सिटी ही वाज द फर्स्ट teacher who taught us in the first class which we had in uet very good ye rabbiya professor miha ziauddin ji rab ji inna nu bahut lambi umar dave te jehdi dekho ji ziauddin sahab tusi jehdi inspiration saryan nu ditti hai tahir sahab nu sohail patti sahab and many others jehde riyaz sahab eh dekho ji hun kive multiply ho rahi hai te agge younger generation nu agge inspiration de de bahut bahut mehrbani aap ji ziauddin sahab miya sahab ji miya ziauddin sahab is the chairman is the is the founder member and also chairman of pakistan society of civil engineers okay we will just start formally bismillah ar rahman ar rahim assalam alaikum and good afternoon to all the participants and greeting to those who are watching us live on facebook <coughs> today pse is presenting its technical lecture number 41 Before I start with the lecture one apology is due from my end because PSC had to reschedule this lecture a week later owing to some inevitable circumstances existing at speaker's end so again please accept my apology on behalf of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers now before I introduce our honorable speaker there are certain rules which I have to spell out in any case the first one is all the registered participants for cpd points have to appear live on the webcam however for the ladies there is an exception if they wish they can cover their face but they have to appear live during the lecture microphone of all the participants except that of speaker shall remain in mute position there will be a question answer session at the end from 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the lecture and uh, however if the if the participants have questions during the lecture they can type it in the chat box if i feel necessary i will interrupt otherwise uh, the our speaker is more comfortable and convenient to have the question answers at the end of the lecture participants on the facebook uh, have a limitation they in any case they will have to type the their questions on the in, in the chat box and at the end of the lecture i will read the, read out the questions and inshallah the, uh, uh, our speaker will answer those questions now i will just introduce the speaker and then inshallah lecture will start ladies and gentlemen today we have a speaker who is dr tarun jeet singh butalia he is he is an internationally known researcher and scholar serves as associate professor of research in department of civil engineering civil environmental and geodetic engineering at ohio state university usa sorry doctor we have given you the trouble it's 5 am in the morning in ohio thank you very much for uh, taking this trouble at such an odd time <clears throat> Dr Saab is an affiliated faculty with the Sustainability Institute and director of coal combustion products program at university in 2019 he was awarded the mcquick award for outstanding teaching 
In 2020, he received, received the David C. McCarthy Engineering Teaching Award and Award for Distinguished Outreach Achievements. His technical specialty is the characterization of natural and synthetic materials and their use in technically sound, environmentally benign, and commercially competitive applications, including infrastructure rehabilitation. Dr. Batalia obtained his BS in civil engineering from Punjab Engineering College, Chandigarh, Masters in Structural Engineering from IIT Bombay, and PhD degree in engineering from the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio, USA in 1997. He is a registered professional engineer. He has provided leadership to several research and demonstration projects totaling over US dollars, 30 million in the last 30 years and has authored, presented, published more than 200 technical papers and book articles. He serves on the advisory board of the International Pittsburgh Coal Conference and is associate editor of the Journal of Coal Combustion and Gasification Products. So this was a very brief introduction of Dr. Saab. Dr. Saab, now the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Ji Tahir Saab. Thanks for the very kind invitation from the Pakistan Civil Engineers. Uh, Ji, I am a graduate of Punjab Engineering College, Chandigarh, which was part of UT Lahore before 1947. As many of you probably are aware, it was a McLigan College of Engineering. And I came to Pakistan in 2019 for the Geotechnical Conference. And I was quite amazed uh, at the love and affection shown by the faculty, staff, students, and the attendees. And several of you are here today. Uh, in particular, uh, many of you consider me to be your own graduate since I graduated from the uh, child institution that came through McGilligan College of Engineering. Since that time, I have been back several times, met with the department. I was recently in Lahore a week ago and did have the opportunity to have lunch, sorry, dinner uh, with several of you, which was indeed a pleasure to be able to do. Before some of you came on, I was complimenting that PSC is not only do a great job getting those who have been established in the profession for a long, long time, which is important. And uh, Professor Zia, Ziauddin is here with us, who has been their professor. And it is also nice to see younger people on the call today. So I think this is a continuity that happens that we, we always pay forward. And so that is what PSC is doing, is what they have learned, they are paying forward to the younger generation so we can all mentor each other and learn from each other. The topic of my presentation, and I will now pull it up, uh, my uh, details of how to contact me are in the chat box. And so you're welcome to take a look at that if you need to be in touch with me. The title of my presentation uh, is the beneficial use of coal combustion byproducts and their use in sustainable infrastructure rehabilitation. Uh, I have been working in this area of research uh, for almost uh, 30 years. And of these 30 years, about the first five were primarily uh, looking at lab analysis and characterization because before we can use any material in civil engineering practices, we have to be able to study it. So what I'm presenting today is over 25 years of experience and knowledge that I have had on full scale CCB constructed facilities. So all these facilities are full scale, all of them, and they're made of coal combustion byproducts. So what I'll be covering is the design, construction, and monitoring. I expect to take anywhere from 55 minutes to about an hour and I'm hoping that at the end of that, we will have enough time for comments, questions, suggestions, and pathways forward. I do want to acknowledge several of my PhD students uh, who they are primarily the ones who do the work. I take the credit as a professor, as many of you who are faculty know, but really the credit does go to our students who do. And this work I'm presenting here probably has about five PhDs and about 10 to 12 
master students, so it's an outcome of their work. I recognize that there is a wide variety. Civil uh, that are present today. So I will try not to go into too many technical details, very detailed, but during Q&A, we are welcome to do that. And I will also make these slides available uh, to PSCE office in case somebody would like the PDF version of them. So let's first talk about, uh, here is the outline of my presentation. I'll talk about what are these byproducts and how are they generated, what is the difference among them? And then I have about seven different facilities, which are all full scale, uh, that we have constructed here at the Ohio State University, where the uh, particular engineering company or the power plant constructs the facility and we work with them on design and then we do the monitoring. So this has allowed, so the work that we do brings in government agencies, the university and the private sector together. The government agencies are the ones that provide us funding for research. The construction of all of these facilities, and I'll cover each one of them, are the ones that are covered by the industry. So the industry does the construction, uh, we are involved in the design, and then we do the monitoring and the evaluation of these projects. And the last, I will touch upon the OSU Coal Combustion Products Program, which has been in place at the university for three decades, almost three decades now. So let's first talk about what are the CCBs of coal combustion products. Some will call them CCPs, coal combustion products. Others will say coal combustion residues. Uh, I will use the term coal combustion byproducts because these are byproducts produced from the generation of electricity or steam from coal. And we can view them either as waste material. That's one way to say it, right? In that case, we'll call them coal combustion wastes. In this case, what we are saying is, yes, you have a waste stream, but the waste stream has certain part of this waste stream that is environmentally benign, has beneficial uses that can be used in infrastructure rehabilitation within civil engineering. The CCB, the solid material minerals that remain after polarized coal is burned to generate city or steam. Here in the US, uh, we produce about 120 million tons and the annual production of the state that I come from is 12 million. So you can see that about 10% of all these materials in the US are generated in the state of Ohio. And that is why this has become important for us as a university. We are probably one of the leading experts in coal combustion residues here in the US along with the University of Kentucky, which is a state right next to us. And they have, I think their annual production of CCBs is about 8 million tons. And we have the World of Coal Ash, which is a two-year conference that happens every other year. It's coming up in the middle of May. So that is where all coal ash people, it's a coal ash party. So we all go there. We have our own insider jokes that we do. The different types of materials I will cover today are primarily three, fly ash, bottom ash, and flue gas desulfurization material. I will not cover boiler slag as much because in essence, if your boiler has a dry bottom, then you get bottom ash, which is like a sand uh, material. Boiler slag happens when you have a wet bottom boiler and very few such boilers are left. They would be old ones. And so I won't color boiler slag. And fly ash, as the name implies, is small particles of ash that fly with the flue gases and I have a schematic here to show you. Here we go. So what we have here is, here is the coal feed coming in, and here is our boiler. If we have dry bottom boilers, we would have bottom ash, which has the uh, texture of coarse sand. On the other hand, if the boiler bottom is wet, then we have a slaggy material. We refer to as water slag. The flue gases then go through several processes. They might go through uh, removing of NOx if need be. And generally, either an ESP or a baghouse, electrostatic precipitator or a baghouse or a combination of them is used to capture the solid residues that go with a fly ash, with a flue gas, sorry. That's a flue gas going in this direction. That's what is captured is fly ash. 
and fly ash is handled in two primary ways. It was traditionally handled in the US uh, as a wet material, so it had to go to a pond. And as you know, every time we use water, the hydraulics becomes easier, but contamination potential becomes much more significant. More recently, the fly ash handling is now done dry, in essence. So in the US, we have moved away completely from wet handling of fly ash, and the same transitions I know are occurring in much of South Asia, including Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. Once from the flue gas, NOx and the solid residue particles have been removed, uh, I should point out a comment about mercury. Mercury is a material in the flue gas which comes from the coal. That is a concern that is going through the flue gases. And what we find is that much of the mercury is neither captured by the NOx removal nor by the fly ash. Very small amounts of mercury are captured by the baghouse or the ESP. Most of the mercury carries through once you have removed the fly ash from the flue gas stream. And in much of the US, especially in the part in the US where I am, our sulfur content of the coal is quite high. It is high sulfur coal. As a result, one has to use a desulfurization process. That is, in general, one would do a dry or a wet injection of some sort of a calcium oxide combination with magnesium oxide mixture. Some sort of lime solution or dry is injected. And there are two further ways in which this FGD or flue gas desulfurization material can be generated. Uh, if you have, uh, if you are not doing forced oxidation, then we will have a sulfite material. And if, on the other hand, one is doing forced oxidation, then one ends up with a sulfate material, which would be FGD gypsum. So in each of these, there are several kinds. So there isn't one CCB. It depends on the boiler that you have, depends on what technology is being used for fly ash removal, what removals occur before that, what kind of boiler you have, what and what temperature and operating conditions, and what kind of coal one is using. So all these are things that have to be taken into the account. The challenge with FGD materials is that most of the uh, mercury seems to reside in the FGD material. So that's a concern one always is concerned about in FGD materials is that the mercury primarily, about 80% of the mercury that's coming from the coal is going to reside in the FGD materials. The arsenic on the other hand, and I'm sure some of you here are environmental engineers, the arsenic gets divided between fly ash and the FGD materials. So those are two, uh, not red flags, but we as engineers, what we do is we look for things that are cautionary. So in fly ash and FGD materials, we are concerned about, we always check for arsenic. And in FGD materials, we want to be able to look for uh, mercury in addition. And after the flue gas desulfurized, uh, this go to smokestacks out. Now, while many countries uh, in South Asia uh, don't have high sulfur coal, but today's environmental regulations in many cases do require the removal of these sulfur particles before the flue gases can go out the smokestack. So what I want to do next is show you uh, each of these materials. The first one is fly ash. Fly ash is quite an interesting material in the sense that it has the grain size distribution of silt. Okay? But the challenge you have is the two kinds of fly ashes. You have a class F, and a class C. This classification strictly comes from the use of fly ash in concrete, but in general is extended otherwise. Class F fly ash is one in which it is not self-cementing. That is to say to this class F fly ash, if I add water, there is not enough calcium oxide available for it to harden up. So to, if I have to harden up class F fly ash, I will not only need to add water, but I will also need to add some calcium oxide. On the other hand, class C fly ash does have certain amount of calcium oxides. All that needs is water and it can set up. Now, 
coming to this non self cementing, obviously, classy fly ash, when you add water, it'll harden up. It has cohesion and has friction, primarily through cohesion. Class F fly ash is very, very interesting. In literature, uh, because class F fly ash has the particle size distribution of silk, it was assumed that class F fly ash, because the particle distribution is silk, when you wet it, okay, it will have cohesion. And this is something that we have worked on the last 20 years of contribution that my research team has done, that while class F fly ash has the particle size distribution of silt. Actually, in fact, the silt we're talking about here is a coarse silt. Now keep in mind that the line between a coarse, the line between uh, silt and sand is an interface, right? Although we have numbers saying below and above, what we have in real life is that while fly ash uh, particles are they technically are coarse silt, but they are so close to fine sand that they actually behave like non-cohesive materials. So here is an example of a material which is human generated, right? It is not naturally generated, which has the particle size distribution of silt, but does not have cohesion. It only, it does have some apparent cohesion when it's wet, but that cohesion isn't very much at all. So this one works, Class F fly ash, whether if it's dry or wet, uh, only has uh, friction, has no cohesion. And class C fly ash, if it is not wetted, only has friction. And once you wet it, it will have cohesion and friction both. Both these materials have some amount of unburned carbon. As you can see that this coal that was coming into the boiler, there is some unburned carbon that is coming along. And so that's why uh, this also includes unburned carbon. And for concrete applications, uh, you see this uh, schematic here that I've shown of particles of fly ash. And you see these ones here is what you see is the unburned carbon. There are limits on each country and state has. Generally, that limit is about if you want to use class F or class E fly ash uh, in cement applications, as a pozzolanic material, then you want to be able to limit the carbon content in the fly ash anywhere from about four to 8%. Different countries and different parts of the world have different types of applications. Another thing unique about silt size particles is these many of these particles are hollow. That is to say, they are like cenospheres. So these particles are hollow. The challenge that we have as geotechnical engineers is we assume in much of soil mechanics that the soil particles are incompressible. Okay? That rule of thumb is violated for fly ash in two ways. One is that the unburned carbon is compressible, right? Number two, the particles themselves, many of them are hollow. As a result, they are also slightly compressible. So what this means is when we talk about B value and others, we have to be able to take that into consideration that we are looking at a material that is slightly compressible. And as I mentioned that it can be handled wet or dry. And I would invite Tahir Saab if at any time you feel that I need to clarify something, please feel free to interrupt me, Tahir Saab, and I would be glad to do so till then. You know, university professors, we talk for an hour, actually 48 minutes here. So after 48 minutes, we go out of energy, but only there's the Boli Java again. The next one I want to talk about is bottom ash. Bottom ash, as I mentioned before, uh, is sand size particles. And you can see the particle shape that is shown here. And this is collected at the bottom of bottom boilers and typically uh, is replaced uh, for sand materials, again, can be handled wet or can be handled dry. This third material that I talked about comes from SO2 control and uh, it's predominantly silk size particles and it can be wet or dry. And as I mentioned, if one does not have forced oxidation, then you have a sulfite material that is shown here. And if you do forced oxidation, we have a sulfate material that is shown here. 
And if you provide enough oxidation, you now have FGD gypsum. So what has happened in the US is that about 95% of all gypsum mines have run out of business because now the material is produced synthetically and it's much, much purer. This FGD gypsum is much, much purer because you can engineer the process rather than depending on mother nature. And so two types of primarily FGD, the dry and the wet. The dry FGD materials primarily work well in facilities that are not very large. What you'll find is a lot of Chinese companies and have done a lot of work in China uh, is their primary technologies are dry FGD materials. Uh, I've been several times to several power plants there. We also have tested as a part of our work over the last two and a half decades, several materials from China in terms of the environmental aspects as well as geotechnical properties. But these would be plants uh, that are more recent. There is a transition from wet to dry. And I talked about the two wet materials, sulfide and the sulfate. Oh, I do want to touch upon this sulfite material that's here. This sulfite material that is produced is like a toothpaste. So you know toothpaste, you cannot store toothpaste, right? So what do you do with the material that is thixotropic, like a toothpaste? So what has to be done to the sulfite material is it has to be dewatered. And along with the dew, now keep in mind, because this sulfite material was created uh, with the injection of calcium oxide, right? There is some calcium oxide in this material. If I were to add fly ash to it, it already has water. It will set up. So I'm creating a polyzolonic reaction. So generally, the sulfite material by itself, it's called a filter cake, cannot be handled. As a result, to the sulfite material, we add fly ash that was already collected in the baghouse or the ESP. And this is what is called the stabilized FGD material. Somebody tells you FGD material, you have asked what kind, you know, what, how was this produced? What process was used? So, and what, um, what reagent was used for desulfurization? Those are details. But this, I think, gives you a nice overview of the materials itself that are generated. We also have some materials that come from combustion or co-combustion of wastes. So there are places that will use rice husk or will use uh, residual waste that comes from municipal landfill. The challenge with all of those is that they can significantly increase the carbon content. But let's keep in mind, the carbon content is only important in these materials, primarily for the use in concrete. In other applications, it is not as important. But that's the place we monitor it most closely. What I've done here is made a list of uh, different types of potential uses of coal combustion byproducts. And these are all projects that you know we have worked on. My favorite one is this Rhino Ganda We we have a farm here at the university in which we have a zoo, so we were able to uh, put in here. A rhino pad. And so that's my, my children. Dad was the cool guy. So I like it. Dad project. I project. 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 So these are all the different types of applications. Those are the ones that my research team we have uh, Maha Ghani, I'm the director of the Coal Commission Products Program. I have two faculty colleagues in environmental engineering who look at environmental aspects and we are assisted by a lab manager. And then we have generally about, my research group typically at any time has about three to four PhD and about five to eight master students who work together. And the ones that we have worked on is concrete, concrete products, structural or global fills, road bases, soil and waste stabilization, aggregate, mining, and an area that has increasingly become important is rare earth element extraction. Uh, what is happening is that the rare earth elements are actually in the coal. Let me go back here. The rare earth elements are in the coal, and where they seem to end up is in the fly ash material. So, and why is this important? 
you know, if I, you can see my picture, we all have our cell phones, right? All our cell phones operate on rare earth elements. Now the challenge has become, and this is a political challenge, why this is important in the US, is because currently China controls the market for rare earth elements. So what has happened is for the United States, and this has been the last, I would say, two decades, whether Democrat or Republican, is that rare earth element extraction domestically has become a national priority because tomorrow if China decides, okay, we don't like this country and we don't want to give you rare earth elements, uh, we will not have too many cell phones. And that's also the reason why in the US, cell phones are so heavily recycled. That is the first thing that's taken out of your phone is the rare earth elements. Since the two sources of rare earth elements that I'm involved with, one is from the fly ash. And the second is, it is coming from uh, acid mine drainage that comes from the site where this coal might be coming from. Because in the end, the rare earth elements are in the coal and they end up in the fly ash or you can go to the mine and get it from there. So those are issues that and applications we have been working on. Uh, so it gives you a nice overview of those. Now here is the different levels of scale. And I think I touched upon earlier in my remarks also, that these are the different levels at which I have been operating. For the first five years, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting. See how you go one for 25? And we've been through this entire cycle for many, many projects. The first thing you do is you have an idea, right? Okay, this might work. You have no idea to see naan vade ho and naan ke nikal de ho baar. It's with, oh, eh, 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 chale. You make this an idea, you share with somebody. And then what you say is, okay, chalo, we, let's go to the lab and do some lab testing and see ke jeda mere damaat futur aya si, o futuru thik hui hai. Ko tana pata, adde futur saade jeda hai hai, they defy the laws of physics, right? We are trying to create energy okay, where it does not exist. Or, you know, if the total energy is this level, how can we have a process that has more energy? So we have to do some lab testing, at which level there isn't much consideration for economics. But then, you know, this is the place where most of us in the university work is in this area. My research in this area was not content. We just, first five years we did lab, then we had to push the envelope forward. The second step, for example, you know, in this case, you're testing a sample, uh, which is looking at a flyer sample uh, or an FGD material sample, which is six by three inches. Sample. You want to create a five million cubic yards structural fill. You have to do intermediate scales. So this is where the bent scale comes in. And I'll show you a couple of slides in which we have created a bent scale in the lab. So this is a scale higher than the lab scale. And then one needs to be able to show a proof of concept. Once proof of concept is done, then one is looking at the economics, how the process, how will materials actually flow? And as most of us who uh, are involved with construction some ways know the biggest challenge in all of these is material processing and how do you move things from one place to another? And how do you mix them? How do you place them? that becomes extremely important. And then we now ultimately move out of the lab. All of the stuff can be done in the lab, enhanced lab. And then we have to do a pilot. Pilot typically would mean a scale that is about one tenth or to one twentieth or full scale. That would be a pilot. And then we go to a full scale demonstration. So this would be about one and one twentieth scale, a full scale. And you can see it takes a good amount of years. That's the typical one. And uh, the full demonstration, and then you have commercial acceptance. There is a valley of death. And that valley of death is here. It's very well known R&D, this is the valley of death. Most ideas will die out in the proof of concept and the process development phase. So that is a caution we always will have. My research team works primarily on geotechnical and structural performance evaluation. As I said, I have colleagues uh, in the environmental engineering faculty who look at the environmental performance. That is to say two things for them. One is what is in the material and what is potentially 
leaching because the pathway uh, most common uh, would be contact through water. And there are some others like uh, dusting with fly ash, you could have inhalation, but those are well understood. The ones that we are most concerned about is the possible contamination of the uppermost aquifer, because that is a low hanging fruit, especially if that uppermost aquifer is also used for drinking water applications. Here are the projects that I have chosen uh, for, and I will cover each of them uh, with a larger overview. And then during Q and if there are more questions, I will come back. And we began looking at a liner for a pond using FGD materials. And then we transitioned our work into looking at the use of fly ash and bottom ash in new pavements, asphalt, as well as concrete. And we were interested there to look at the impact of more than 20 years of highway traffic. And I'll talk about how we were able to simulate this in a full-scale actual load facility here at the university. And then we, why we had done new pavements in the US, uh, about 80 to 90% of all pavements are made of asphalt. And so, we are, so new pavements aren't as many. So we were now interested to look at how are we able to incorporate these materials in the rehabilitation of asphalt pavements that are currently failing. And then we had a transition, as you can see, into mine reclamation, primarily using FGD materials. Uh, these are mine sites that were mined before 1970 and require, from an environmental perspective and from a safety hazard perspective, require that they be remediated. So these three projects that we had, Cardinal, Konzil, and Gavin, I'll talk about, but I'll kind of give you an overview so you can see how they relate to each other. These three are looking at using CCBs that are freshly generated from the power plant and come to the project. Here in the US, we are now looking at a post coal economy. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat. You know, I know that every country, I was there you know, in Lahore when I came to Pakistan, uh, I think for 15 days, uh, you had one prime minister. And then uh, when I left, there was another. But you know, very much like that, the US is very, very divided. But in, we now pretty much have agreement that we are looking at a post coal economy. What this means is the concrete industry, for example, that has gotten so, so used to using fly ash concrete. The fly ash, fresh fly ash is not going to be available. So what are the options? We can either import it. And I met with a couple of people in India in particular, who in fact are looking at exporting fly ash from India. Uh, to the Western coast in California and others because fresh, good quality fly ash is available, but fresh, good quality fly ash is limited. So what has happened is this whole shift of going from fly ash that is virgin material that is freshly produced, right, has now shifted completely to looking at existing ash facilities how could we go in and harvest those materials? How can we go in and take the FGD material that is in the landfill? It's a proper closed out landfill. There's a proper process involved in how do you go to a closed out landfill? How are you excavating or harvesting materials back? And how are you going to go into an ash pond, which is either active or is closed and excavate the material? And in some cases does require treatment depending on the application. So the Ground has now shifted from virgin materials to looking at existing facilities from which you could harvest CCPs. So that transition has already happened because many of the power plants here in the US uh, are in the process of shutting down. So I'll be talking about this whole continuum uh, here in my presentation. So let's then first go to the one, which is the pond facility. Our objective in this case was to be able to look at the stabilized FGD material that has low permeability and to be able to evaluate its permeability characteristics over time. And I said, you know, when I say over time, we are looking at four to five years. We are not looking at 28 days or 60 days. Yeah, we do that in the lab, 
but we also want to be able to construct such a facility. This was constructed in 1996, for eight years. It was 1 million gallons liquid capacity, and it shows you during construction using regular technique. And this was filled first with pond water, regular water. And after we were sure that uh, the permeability was suitable, then it was filled, this is a swine farm. And so we were then filled with swine manure where it currently is still being used. The primary liner is 18 inches of compacted stabilized sulfite FGD material. I covered each of the sulfite material in which we added fly ash, about 3000 tons were placed. And below this facility, there already is a clay layer. That was because this is a full-scale demonstration project. And between the two, there was a leachate collection system. And if you look at this one right here, that's a sump pump you can see. Because below this FGD liner that we have, the leachate collection system, below which was about 30 feet of thick gray uh, clay, uh, in essence, if we pump the water out of this, there's a water differential between this surface and the sump pump. And it is essentially uh, a falling head, but the water level will rise, right? So the, the water level, the pond will remain constant. I Originally, this was here. I pump it down in the sump. And if I let it go, the rate at which water rises, right, again, is a falling head test, is what we had. So we were able to replicate that in the field. Here is what I want to show you. This is the solid line. I'm showing the Kaufman permeability in centimeters per second. You can see that in the first year, the permeability was anywhere from minus six to minus seven centimeters per second, and then it stabilized. And even after the additional swine manure, no significant changes happened. Uh, we then looked at bout well tests. We then looked at some board samples. And our research has shown that they are not reliable. Bout well tests are very difficult to do and cord samples, as you know, along the edges can have significant amount of disturbance. What we saw was interesting was the lab testing. And when we saw these were samples that we made in the lab and we kept them and you see tested them up to about five years. What you will see is exactly what we see in clay. Remember what, what, what they say in clay is, you measure the permeability of clay in the lab. And when you go and construct in the field, you will lose an order of magnitude. That's exactly what we saw. You can see that in the lab testing, it was here in the uh, field testing full scale, it, we lost an order of magnitude, right? It was minus seven, it is minus six on a second in the Field. So we are losing an order of magnitude. The leachate that was collected meets the non-toxic criteria. And in particular, as I said, we are always considered arsenic, mercury, and selenium. And this is one of my students who now uh, is himself a professor, Craig Fortner, uh, who has uh, work that he has done on, and he's the one who did much of this monitoring. The second facility I'm gonna talk about is the accident pavement load facility in which we are looking at incorporating fly ash as well as bottom ash in asphalt and concrete pavements. Uh, I don't know about Pakistan, but in the US, uh, there is this big dialogue whether asphalt pavement is better or concrete. So our biggest challenge in this project was not to get into the dialogue, is concrete better, asphalt better? We are looking at trying to incorporate class set fly ash and bottom ash into the wearing surface, base and sub-base, and subgrades of new concrete and asphalt pavements. But we wanted to be able to test them for a typical life of at least 20 years of highway traffic. Now, uh, there's no way we can wait for 20 years. So one of the things we can do is construct the full-scale pavement. And rather than having a truck go over it, Every five or 10 minutes, we can have a loading facility on which it is loaded all the way about eight hours a day or 12 hours a day. That is what we would call the accelerated pavement load facility. And that is something that our university, along with Ohio University, uh, uh, got funded and is in Lancaster, Ohio. We can cycle the air temperature. Uh, we can cycle the humidity. We can add moisture from below. This is what, essentially it's a pit. 
that is 45 feet long, 38 feet wide, and eight feet deep in the depth direction. And we were able to construct two lanes of full scale asphalt and pavement that were constructed and the traffic would go over this. Now, this is the system that we have. I think this shows the asphalt pavement view. This is a loading mechanism that goes back and forth that can simulate up to 20 years. And I'll talk about easels and others details. So there are ways in which we can accelerate the structural loading. You cannot accelerate environmental loading, but you can accelerate that. Here's what was interest to us is in both of these pavements as a subgrade, we're looking at soil stabilization. We're looking at the sub base and the bases. The wearing surface of asphalt concrete here in much of the US, there are a lot of fines available. So there isn't much of a need to add fly ash in concrete or bottom ash. Plus they also take some additional bitumen, especially when we are looking at uh, bottom ash. But in the wearing surface here, we did include high volume fly ash mixes in the wearing surface of that. And here is a summary of the different, in the concrete slab, we use class F fly ash. This has all the lab testing that was done before any construction was done. We have base and the sub base at fly ash and bottom ash. And the subgrade was done using class F fly ash and lime or soil stabilization. So it gives you a sense, you can see leaching potential is, goes through each one of them. All these lab testing had to be done before we proposed our control sections. Control means there is no cold combustion product in them and the CCP, the CCD amended sections would have. We were looking at state highway and the design life is 20 years for 1 million equivalent single axle loadings. That's what we're looking at, 20 years. So this is how it was designed. So in essence, this is, if you can see three sections, of the uh, concrete, the asphalt below. One section was kept control for both of them. That is no CCBs were used. The other two had CCBs in them. And the middle part of each of the- Dr. Bhattalia, are... Dr. Bhattalia, can I can I intervene, please? Please. Yeah. So here Raza is, uh, has, he has just commented. So I thought maybe it is of interest to you. He is, uh, he has, he has said, Dr. Butalia, your particular comments are solicited, uh, solicited on the disparity between field and lab probability values. Sure, Ji. Let me go back to you there. Ji, what it is that, as many of you are aware in geotechnical engineering, it is well understood that because it is very difficult to measure field permeability, we give ourselves a factor of safety of about 10 when it comes to permeability. So if in the field, I want a permeability value of 10 exponential minus six centimeters per second, because measuring in the field is so difficult, what we generally use, somebody is drawing on there, that wasn't me, but don't worry, uh, is that we generally take an order of magnitude that would be lower in the lab. So if you want 10 minus six in the field, you would want 10 minus seven per second in the lab. And what we found the same thing worked for us for FGD materials. So our recommendation is that one does not need to measure the permeability in the full scale field. Whatever you want the performance criteria in the lab, achieve a permeability value that is an order of magnitude lower. See, minus, six, minus seven is lower than minus six, and that will be suffice. Uh, let me at this time pause and see if uh, Suhail Saab has a follow-on question or a comment since we are paused at this topic. I'm sorry, the question was from yeah. Suhail Kibriya, not Suhail Raza. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Suhail Kibriya. Yeah, I I'm you. here. I'm here, and uh, I, I would like to thank Dr. Butalia on very explicit explanation. Uh, I would like to add, and uh, I would also like Dr. Butalia to comment further that uh, the uh, field permeability values are dependent on the method of uh, permeability determination. Uh, if casing is used, you see, and a soil column is introduced by drawing the casing up, 
then there is a kind of smearing effect also and sometimes it is understood that the field values may tend to be lower than the representative values in reality because of the smearing effect on the inner surface of the borehole uh, what would you say about that kind of situation dr butalia ki that's what i have referred to the botwell test as exactly the botwell test that you see here the three are exactly the process where you then lift it up what is happening is that as soon as you disturb the egg smearing so let's have you talk about you have suddenly increased the probability value more water will go through and so that is why if you see they were unreliable now the code, the code one will have a lot more disturbance in them and that is why our recommendation is uh, this value you see we were able to do uh, the full scale tests was because below this we have a leachate collection system below which we have an impervious layer so when we reduce the water level in here the water in the pond remain constant when we pumped it down as it rose up in the sump we had a falling head test or the head difference between the two surfaces is reducing and that is how we calculated the actual permeability of the full scale facility but i agree with you that these boutwell test code or many many methods are out there uh, they can work well for materials that are relatively homogeneous so if you have a material but in this case the fgd material sometimes can be can have clumps in them and that can make things even worse so our recommendation has been that uh, as generally is done is give ourselves a factor of 10 and in the lab let's get a probability value of minus 7 if in the field we want Minus six. Thank you, Suhail Sir, for asking your question. This is exactly if you have things, please type up, and Tahir Sir, at his convenience, can interrupt me as need be. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Butalia. Thanks a lot. Uh, as I have understood with my experience also, and as you have said, perhaps when the casing is lifted, uh, the interface between the outer surface of the casing and the ground the bore wall perhaps there is a place from where the uh, water would rise tend to seep out and rise out and uh, would tend to show in the test as increase in the permeability fictitiously is it so sir absolutely yeah, absolutely because wherever you have disturbance the permeability is certainly going to increase right so uh, thanks. The, thanks. The thanks a lot sir thanks a lot thank you So you're coming back to the concrete and the asphalt. This is where the tire will run over this. As a result, it is only the central area that has sensor, and this gives you an example of the uh, flexible pavement. The control section has no CCBs in the base or the aggregate, and then we had base and the sub base, different mixes that had different amounts of uh, fly ash added to them. We then. throughout below this we had 18 inches of stabilized a6 soil and then we had unstabilized and aggregated the bar and then the tire that we had that would would go over the over over the top of this each of these in this direction and uh, the one that we had for fly ash in terms of concrete uh, this is the plain concrete the control section with 30% replacement of cement with fly ash and 50% replacement so as you go from uh black is control ccp1 and ccp2 the red one has greater amount of fly ash in ccrs compared to ccp1 and this shows some of my students this is the control section 30% 50% and this is being on this cc some of the places it has been monitoring that's going on i'll show you schematic of that there we go and uh, without going into any details the central wheel path was done and of course we wanted to see uh, what kind of strains occur on the top of the concrete slab and the bottom uh, we also were interested in thermocouples we were placed we were also interested in uh, looking at the um, uh, the uh, longitudinal strains that's the black one that you have here we also were interested in how much each layer compresses so they were heavily monitored we are also looking at pore water pressure monitoring that need to be done right here and we also were trying to see what is the pressure that comes from the pavement onto the stabilized soil 
So several things we were interested in. And of course, the asphalt pavement, uh, we were more interested in light to asphalt trains, several pressures coming on to the stabilized base and unstabilized base, and just a lot more detail in the asphalt one. Because in the concrete one, we want bridging to happen, right? And in this case, we know the asphalt concrete is more going to go down. As a result, we want to pressure here also. Our, our objective here was to do 1 million easels, which is 20 years. If we had a tire, which was 15,000 pounds, and when I say 15,000 pounds, these are dual tires. That is, say there's one tire, there's one tire behind it. So you have two tires of 15,000 pounds, to do 130,000 passes would give us 20 uh, years of traffic. That is 1 million easels. So we could do one and a, about one and a half month of AP lift testing. By bi-directional, I mean, while going and coming back, it is loading the pavement at five miles per hour, at five per hour, eight hours a day, five days a week. What we were interested in is, yes, we were interested in mechanical work. That is 20 years of traffic. What we were also interested after that is to see what about environmental effects. Most pavements fail because of moisture infiltration. And here in the US, because we have free star cycling, we were also interested in free star cycling. And so after doing phase one, in which we tested both the concrete and asphalt pavements with 20 years of highway traffic, we then exposed both of them to an additional 35,000 cycles as you can see. And the asphalt one obviously was for freeze thaw and elevated temperature and the concrete one also. And in both the cases, we first saturated the pavement base to be able to test for the most intrusive or the worst loading condition. Uh, I showed you some of the uh, devices that were placed. In addition, we had the FWD test or the falling weight deflectrometer testing. We then looked at rutting and cracking of the pavement and environmental monitoring. And this FWD test, I thought I had, maybe I'll come to that in a second. Uh, I think in one of the sketches for the asphalt pavement I had, is I talked about each pavement first had 36,000 cycles, and then water was allowed into the pavement after 20 years of traffic. And then we did saturation of freeze thaw, and then another 30,000 cycles for elevated temperature. Testing. So by the time we were done with this, you can see that we had about a little more than 30 years of highway traffic, uh, that is structural loading on the pavement for the asphalt. This gives you the uh, different types of, we're looking at the peak dynamic deflection in terms versus number of load repetitions. And so you can see this is the load repetition, this is phase one. And look what happens in phase two. Wow. Look at what happened. The control worked quite well, right? And look at the CCP sections. They work better than the control. But what happened when we introduced water, the phase two, and had temperature cycling? Boom, the control section went out of the window. So this shows you that the CCP sections uh, perform slightly better than the control section during phase one, just structural loading. But as soon as we introduce environmental effects, the CCP sections saw a little bit of degradation, but the control sections completely went out. In fact, we saw significant rutting. And I think I have some rutting data also to share. And this shows you, and this data primarily comes from a journal paper that we had published in terms of different LVDTs and all the different data set that we have. We were also interested in the peak longitudinal tensile strains that were there. And this shows you some of those, again, the two CCP sections behave very similar and perform better than the control section. However, as soon as we began saturation and temperature cycling, they both degraded, but the CCP section still worked better. So I have several data like that. In this case, for peak transfer progressive strains, you can see that they all behave quite similarly. Let me come back to FWD. I thought I had, but maybe I apologize that let me go to a sketch of a pavement. Here we go. FWD test in essence is done in the field. And this was done by a state DOT 
in which on a regular basis, uh, a machine was brought onto the pavement and essentially it drops. There is a drop that happens here. And from the point of the drop, deflections of the pavement are measured at a certain distance away from the place at which the load is dropped. And through an inverse analysis, uh, primarily linear in this case analysis, the modulus of each of these layers is calculated. And so that's what the results I'm showing here are the FWD tests that were back calculated with the modulus using FWD tests. As you can see here, this is the control section, right? Asphalt control sections. We are looking at the residual modulus of the base and the sub-base there. That's what we are interested in. And you can see they were much higher. As we went along, there was a slight degradation of the residual modulus in the control section. In the CCP sections, we saw much more signal decline, but still it was two to three times that of the control sections at the end of 20 years of site. And this then shows you water infiltration. This is not a representative data because this was done during a freezing cycle, right? So when something is frozen, it's modulus, obviously it will be very, very high. This is what we found at the end of the testing that for the CCP pavements, asphalt concrete pavements had resumed about two to three times that of the control sections. Rut development is becomes important because everything that happens below a pavement is gonna show up on the surface as rutting. And as we know, in most cases, before we have structural failure, uh, we rutting is a performance-based evaluation. And so I show all those three here. This black line is the control section. And you can see the rut that developed in uh, this yellow line is one of our uh, fellow attendees that is being creative in drawing. So you can ignore that line. You can see that the one of the CCP sections behaved quite similar to up till 20, 20 years of highway traffic. The one CCP section behaved slightly better. But what happened here, water was applied. The time when rutting really, really began to happen is when the temperature of the facility was increased. And now you can see that, look at this line. This is the failure depth, rutting depth for asphalt in, in terms of M. Our asphalt pavement control section failed in, not structural, failed in performance, whereas the CCP sections did not. So this has been very helpful for us to be able to document that one can use uh, these materials uh, in certain sections of the asphalt pavements, base and sub-base in particular, we were not looking, as I said, at using them in the wearing surface, where in some parts of the world where there aren't enough fines, that is also used. The second part of the data is doing with concrete pavements. And in this case, again, we had 20 years of cycle, and then we had saturation and free thaw for about 34,000 and 10,000 with elevated temperature site. Uh, similarly, we have several types of uh, monitoring that we did into the peak longitudinal strains. They were similar between asphalt and concrete, uh, sorry, between CCP and the control section. And you see a phase one, and there's more, this variation that you see in phase two is because the different environmental applications we had applied at different times during the testing, but similar results. We saw the same thing with peak transfer strains versus load repetitions, very similar results between the control sections and the CCP sections. Here is what we, our conclusions were of the project, that the CCP pavement section exhibits similar or better performance than control under accelerated loading. Okay? At the end of phase one, that is 20 years of traffic, none of the pavement sections fail in terms of rutting, rutting would be applicable to asphalt, fatigue racking to concrete. So it did not fail in phase one, okay? Now, it was different in phase two. For the Portland cement concrete pavements, they did not fail even in phase two. There was no fatigue damage occurred in any of them, okay? In fact, our observation is that the, for the concrete pavements, the control and the CCD section behaved similarly. None was better than the other. 
On the other hand, for the asphalt concrete pavements, our control section failed in phase two when we had water, pre-saw cycling, and particularly when the temperature was increased in the facility as would happen in summer. And uh, I know in Pakistan, the temperature is about 110 or so. Uh, here in Ohio, it's 60 right now. And so it is nice to come out of an oven. And Delhi was also, oh, Mary, you know, man, or Baga the cross cafe, yes, it's a little bit of a to Delhi. So, can then Asman se gira khajur me latka? Oh, wali gal hoi si, Mary. Dono jaga garmi, the othe bhi apna pollution da bura ha. So, ji, your CCP section had a control section. It failed during phase two, whereas the CCP sections did not. Our environmental testing, we did both surface water and groundwater infiltration, that there are certain criteria with which uh, the materials are non-toxic. We did not exceed any of them in our analysis, and that data is also published in literature. Uh, Tahir Saab, any question or comment up till now? Anything else that you see before I go to the next facility? I have one comment from uh, Suhail Kibria again. He's, uh, he has asked, kindly describe the pattern of instrumentation made on the pavement. Sure. Okay. So you, what we were, let me first come to the asphalt one because this has a lot more instrumentation. So what is happening in the asphalt pavement is, so this is the top view of the pavement. And so these are LPDTs in which we are interested to see how much does this layer compress, this layer. How much this layer compress, now why do we do this? If I subtract the compression from this layer with this layer, it tells me how much does this layer compress? What we are most interested in is this stabilized base layer. And if I subtract the compression of this LVDT with this LVDT, it tells me how much this compresses. So there, for each of these, there's a reason why we are interested. And this then shows you a cross-section through the depth. This is the top view, and this is all under the wheel path. Then what we are also in asphalt pavements is, we're interested in the longitudinal and transfer strain at the bottom of the asphalt. So this is the asphalt there. So this is the strain gauge, longitudinal and transverse. And as you know, in much of field work, uh, only about, if you are lucky, 80% of your instrumentation will work. About 20 to 30%, so you build a lot of redundancies. You actually put more instrumentation in, knowing that about one third of instrumentation simply will be garbage or water will get there, something will happen. And so we were looking at these locations. Then we were also interested in looking at the temperature profile. So that is where thermocouples come in. Because we are looking at soil stabilization, we did also want to know in each of the three sections, what is the pressure coming on top of the stabilized base? When I say base, I mean stabilized soil. It shouldn't say base, or stabilized soil, it should say. And that what is coming uh, onto the unstabilized soil. So we're interested in that. And then we are also part of interested in pore water pressure. As we are aware, most asphalt pavements fail because pore water pressure in the uh, soil subgrade increases as the result is real model reduces and then we have run. That is the reason why we wanted to be able to have this particular pore water pressure device so depending on the larger advice would be is depending on the importance of the project. Obviously, you can't monitor, we can't monitor everything, right? It's too cost expensive, too cost prohibitive. So what we have to do is to be able to monitor things that we think are important for the work that we are doing. So I wanted to go through this process. So why were we interested in certain quantities and then what needs to be done? Uh, if anybody is more interested, we have a complete technical report because most of this research was done for government agencies. We have technical reports available on our website that have the entire project, all their pictures of the instrumentation, all of that, and similarly for concrete. Let me pause here and see if Suhail Kibriya Saab has a follow-on question or a comment.
सुहेल साहेब डॉक्टर बुटालिया साहब वेरी इलेबोरेट डिस्क्रिप्शन गिवन बाय यू द इंस्ट्रूमेंटेशन नेटवर्क लुक्स क्वाइट इंप्रेसिव यू सी एंड आई अंडरस्टैंड देयर वुड बी ऑटोमेटिक डेटा एक्विजिशन यूनिट्स टू यू सी टू गैदर द होल लॉट ऑफ डेटा व्हिच वाज यूज्ड फॉर एनालिसिस द चैलेंज सुहेल साहब एज यू नो एज इंजीनियर्स इज दैट समटाइम्स वी हैव नो डेटा एंड देन वी हैव टू मच ऑफ डेटा राइट and half the data can be garbage so the biggest challenge is trying to figure out the good data from the bad data and that's a challenge i see another question on accelerated uh, pavement cyclic loading can we address that now since i'm at the topic here quite right sir thanks a lot sure here we go what it is that to load a pavement Uh, Have you read the question by Latif Bhatti on the in the chat box? Uh, the question that Latif Bhatti is asking is, can you please have an accelerated cyclic loading adopted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Of this Correct. can only be done for the structural loading, not for the environmental aspects. And in essence, uh, one one has to do for twenty years of highway traffic. One can do one million easels with a certain load which is 9000 pounds a 9000 pound tire going back and forth on a pavement 1 million times is considered in the us to be equal to 20 years of traffic if i can increase the load from 9000 to 15000 so that's one thing i have increased right the second thing i'm doing is now on an actual road a 9000 pound load will maybe come every 10 minutes what if i can do it constantly that is what brings so this 1 million easels is a 9000 pound 1 million uh times has to go over the pavement is 20 years of traffic if i increase my load to 15000 pounds and i have the tire go at 5 miles per hour five repetitions per hour eight or five days a week i can get the testing done in 1.35 months which means 130000 so i have reduced my number of cycles down by almost an order of magnitude right that's the advantage that you have here that we have It is the number of cycles that we need is significantly reduced by increasing the load and the frequency with which the load comes onto the pavement is also increased uh is there any follow on question uh, uh, patti latif saab that you might have on this topic since we are here uh thank you so much uh, dr bataria for uh, uh, i mean elaborating this in detail uh, my uh, uh, i have a little uh, little uh, further query and uh, when you convert the uh, msl uh, million cylinder diesel load to uh, i mean 9000 pound diesel to 15000 it means around you have uh, increased it about two uh, more than two two time and uh, uh it is ratio is about four time four of fourth power or 4.4 of power right. so it come to this way agreed but uh, i'm just uh, my question was that how you are on on which speed you are adopting by, in, in which period of time uh, you are passing the cell axle those so that this uh, cyclic loading i mean i mean uh, is, is achieved instead of dynamic loading Uh, show ji what we are doing is first of all the tire has to go slowly enough that is why the speed is slow the speed cannot be too high so we have to so the first thing from 1 million easels because now first of all, we don't recommend 50000 pounds is not legal though okay <laughs> that's the first thing so i would not recommend you bring 15000 pound thing onto a pavement we can do it in a lab by increasing from 9 to 15 as you said latif saab rightfully we will need 130000 passes now you can do it many ways you can if i were to do one directional it will become uh, uh, about 3 months the speed has to be slow enough typically a facility because of people who work there cannot be more than 8 hours a day 5 days a week but what we are trying to achieve is 130000 cycles on the pavement by increasing the load from 9 to 15 i would not recommend you put a non legal load you know on any pavement is only meant for an fhwa uh, has a particular it's an exponential and i think tahir sahab you kind of implied to that also that this is this factor of 15 uh, over 9 this is an exponential relationship with the number of cycles that are needed 
So we don't need a million of 9,000, but 15,000, we only need 130,000. Uh, Dr. Tali, another question, uh, can you, uh, I mean, the relation of uh, strain uh, caused by, uh, I mean, a, a, a double of the excel, standard excel load, uh, can you have a, a relation of a normal to the, the any correlation with the stain? Uh, but what I'll do is, I think we have that in our report. And uh, maybe what I'll do is after we are done, I'll tell you what, I am going to again send everyone uh, my contact information. And just send me an email and I'll get you an answer to the question. It is in the FHWA book. Uh, I'm sure we have a reference and I'll send you the final report that we have on this project. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll keep going then. It's nice as we get through a project, we can take questions. I think that's a better way uh, that we have. So, Oops. and now I come to we had done work on uh, new pavements, and as I mentioned, that most of the work here in the U.S is on existing pavements, 90% of which are asphalt. So we are now looking at full depth reclamation of an asphalt pavement. And this was a four mile long feeling asphalt section. So like I said, all of these, we did the state DOT, they're all full scale projects. And in this case, we were looking at using class F fly ash because as I mentioned, class F fly ash is non-self-cementing, non pozzolanic non In order to activate it, we have to add lime or lime kiln dust something in addition to water. So what is done in this case is, and the reason why this is important is, this is what's typical that we have, is we have failing pavements. And the reason why this pavement has failed in rutting is not necessarily because the wearing surface has failed, okay? The base and the sub-base have failed, water infiltration has happened, and the base and sub-base have failed, or in some cases, subgrade has failed, and as a result, the pavement has done. So what we need to be able to do is in reconstruction of full pavements is very, very expensive. And from a sustainability perspective is not the way to go. We want to be able, if I reconstruct this pavement, I want to be able to use as much of the existing material as possible. So for every dollar that I have, so we are looking at the recycle reclamation of existing pavements has to be a priority. So here is what pretty much happened. This is my old pavement. This is the base and the sub-base. This is the grand material below. On top of this is my wearing surface, right? So what is typically done is the wearing surface is removed. The top couple of inches of asphalt is first removed completely. And it's taken to an asphalt recycling plant, okay? And that will, part of that will come back to this facility when we are done or go somewhere else. So the entire asphalt layer that we have is recycled. Then what one essentially is a very simple mechanism. It is an in-place full depth reclamation that we use some sort of a grinder in which we take all of the distressed pavement or the base and the sub-base that has failed. And if need be, if we need some finer materials, we can in increase this depth further below as has been done, you can see. We add some lime or lime kiln dust, some pozzolanic material, add water. And then behind this, there is, this is called a rototiller. Behind this, there is a compaction equipment that is coming to compact. So this is an in-place reconstruction of the road. And what we are trying to do in this case is to use some, and we, here are the following ones that we use. Cement is used, fly ash, lime, and emulsion to create a new base. And then the asphalt, uh, that was sent, part of it comes back here, or some other projects asphalt comes on top of this. And short of full reconstruction, this is the most cost-effective method to correct base and sub-base problems. What does fly ash do? Fly ash provides silica and alumina, which is needed for cementuous reactions. And you know that uh, the uh, line that we add are all the pozzolanic reaction, but they need silica and alumina, which comes from fly ash. And the fly ash also acts as a mineral filler. It fills in the larger voids that you have once you pulverize the base layer and the sub-base layer. As a result, the permeability is reduced. So the second part, reduce the permeability 
of the stabilized layer, the basin subbase, so less water infiltration happens. And the first one, the pozzolanic reaction increases strength, stiffness, and the durability. So what we are most interested in stiffness and strength, probably more increase in stiffness than strength, because stiffness is, the lack of stiffness is what typically will cause the failure of rutting for an asphalt pavement, even though it has not failed. Here are our project sites that we did. We had two, in fact, three. We did two in 2006, one in 2007. I'll only probably talk about this one in Delaware. Uh, this is the full-scale section, about four miles. We had several different parts. We had about half a kilometer that was looking at cement, because that is the existing technology or the competing technology that is used. Then we had a 1.3 kilometer section with cement. We had a 1.1 kilometer with lime kiln dust, just lime kiln dust. Then we had a mill and fill. This is what's typically done these days, is uh, if there is no money, you simply rototill the material, you add water, and you recompact it. The ones that are interest to us are these two sections of the bar. Station five for one kilometer was 5% lime kiln dust with 5% fly ash, and gives you all these were designed depth of stabilization, depending on the traffic. And this is quarry traffic. So this road up here, uh, at, you know, uh, up here has a quarry by a strand road. So this has heavy truck loading coming on it. And we were required in this case to keep traffic open during the construction of the project. And that's what's nice about full depth reclamation. You were, and there are homes on both sides. So we had to keep traffic open during construction. It was done with the county engineers and the state DOT. And the second section we had, the station six was 4% line not lime kiln dust, 4% lime with 6% fly ash with same stabilization depth. So these were the different sections that we had. Again, as Sohail Kibriyasav asked, you can see we had already done the previous project, right? So now uh, we knew what instrumentation to put. Uh, so what has happened is that originally this asphalt layer, asphalt was removed, taken to the recycling plant. Then the this portion was rototilled, and up till this point is where the mixture happened. And to this, we added these pozzolanic materials that I talked about and was recompacted. This is the portion that we did not touch. So this is the reclaimed base. This is the unreclaimed base. So we were looking at obviously the compression of different layers, laundry transfer strains as we did at the bottom of the asphalt layer. Uh, we were uh, at this lysimeter is to collect uh, environmental water quality samples. We wanted, because fly ash is here in this layer, we wanted to be able to look at what the water quality is of this one. And then we have the pressure coming on the unreclaimed base and then our pore water pressure. So very similar to, because we'd already done the previous project, we simply extended our knowledge in this case. Now, uh, in this case, if you observe, this is a real road. In a real road, the traffic path, the wheel path is not going to be in the center, right? It will be at the edge. So we had done the outer edge. So we were able to do that. And this is the schematic I wanted to show you of the following way they clock. I mean, this animation was working. So no, it did not. Uh, this is the actual device on our site. You can see there's a home here. And this was done on a regular basis where there is a weight that drops down when the load hits, it is measuring what the deflection of the surface is at these points. And through an inverse analysis, one is able to find what the modulus is of each of these layers. The ones that are closer give us the modulus of the layers that are immediately below. The ones outer one are the ones the subgrade are farther away. And these tests were done by a state DOT. We did four years of field monitoring. So as I said, you know, you can see, we did test before we did it full depth reclamation, before any work was done, okay? And then three weeks, seven months, 10, all the way up to four years. So we've collected a significant amount of data. And what I also want to show you here is different sections that we have, okay? So this is the cement and emulsion, cement, LKD and emulsion, control, LKD fly ash, line and fly ash, okay? So th this is what we began with, okay? 
Okay, this is the control. You can see very insignificant, right? There we go. Let's first deal with the control simply means that we took the material, we pulverized it, added water and compacted it, right? So you can see there is some improvement, not significant. It was clear to us that the emulsion that we used did not really benefit along with the cement. You can see cement is here. Look at cement and emulsion. I would expect better results. If I go back and look at S1, 2% cement with emulsion, this at 5% cement, or we should have added more cement. So the learnings that we do as we go through. So if you were to go back and reconstruct this, I would increase the cement. Um, I would actually do some more lab testing first to have some more, some, do cement and cement and emulsion and see if I can do the cement, but increase the emulsion. This did not work for us. This is a cement section that we had. If you can see the LKD and emulsion also was not very effective. So that's why it's led us to wonder if the issue was not with the amount of LKD or cement, but rather the emulsion mix that we use. So you know, always when you go back, this is constructed. So we, we can't go back and construct again, right? But we can make conclusions based on what we are observing and then go back and do some lab testing. So the cement section, the LKD and fly ash and the lime and fly ash section are three that we want to focus on because this is the standard kind of, not the control, but this is what is commonly used. As you can see that suddenly it increased, went up. Now, if you look up here, you can see winter months are coming, right? Prison modulus or the elastic modulus does not remain constant. It is a function of temperature and weather. So there is curing happening. So depending on when they are done, one has to compare them. And so what we find is that, and I have drawn certain lines here, this is the elastic modulus and modulus or lime stabilized soils. Here is soil cement, and this is where the line is for open graded cement stabilized aggregate. And if you look, the cement one did well, and there isn't as much variation in the cement one as you see in the LKD fly ash and lime and fly. They also worked well, but slightly less. You see much more variation here. There isn't much variation with time, right? Here, there's a lot more variation that happens with time. And this line that you see here goes up to here. I don't know if you can see that. This line goes here. and This one is going up to here. So our conclusion of this is that the uh, I'll only limit others ones I've already talked about the control, LKD emulsion, cement and emulsion ones we believe did not work for us. We probably didn't have the right emulsion. But the cement one obviously exceeded that of an open grade cement stabilized aggregate. But one challenge we have is we don't want our base to be so strong. If the base of an asphalt pavement is too strong, what happens? Reflective cracking. What we ideally want is something between these two values of soil cement and open grade cement stabilized aggregate. And that is where the fly ash or the CCB sections worked very, very well. Uh, I, I, I'm wondering if, no, I don't have the data, but in our report, we have the data for each of these for all the different months that were done. And these were actually field FWB tests that were done by our state DOT. So they were done by an outside agency. And uh, there might be a question, so in this section, I'll come to that. These were pictures taken in 2013, and they all, uh, as you can see, have functioned very, very well. The only one that had failed and needed some repairs is the control section, the cement and emulsion, and the LKD and emulsion section, and they failed uh, on the outer wheel pad, this outer wheel pad that you had. Uh, here are the conclusions from the work that the pavement sections for full depth reclamation made with fly ash uh, and LKD or lime, they show comparable stiffness to cement stabilized set up to four years. And we went through four seasons of winter. And the use of fly ash uh, along with LKD or lime can provide significant savings in terms, for example, in these mixes, there is no cement. In these mixes, station five and six, there is no cement whatsoever. It's a cement-free mix. And uh, the equipment that was used was standard construction equipment. There was a rototiller 
and uh, adding water, uh, adding right amount of uh, lime and fly ash, mixing it well, making sure the moisture, you provide right amount of water, not too much, not too little, and then mixing it uniformly is the key. If you cannot mix things uniformly, some places will be too stiff, some places will be too soft. But we use regular pressure equipment, and we also looked at the leaching, and we saw that none of the elements of concern uh, were uh, exceeded. One thing interesting you found, if you see here, I talk about this lasameter, right? The permeability of this base for our cement and fly ash, lime, and LKD was so low that we hardly could get water out because you would suck water out of the pore space. So the permeability of this base layer was so much lower for the cement, LKD, and fly ash, and lime, and fly ash mixes that we had. I talked very low permeability. Uh, at this time, let me pause and uh, Tahir Saab, are there any questions for me in terms of uh, the full death reclamation project? Uh, well, I just missed out earlier. Uh, Latif Bhatti had another comment, or he has said that it was a question, Dr. Bhatta. In case of asphalt, won't you need a hot recycle? If you want to answer it now, you can. Otherwise, yes. at the end of the lecture. Deji, this is good. This is perfect. As we get through one topic, I think we should answer that. Let me go back to this one, the previous one, because I have full schematic of an asphalt pavement. And there we go. So let's focus on the asphalt pavement that we have. You can tell I'm a structural engineer. I call it asphalt concrete, right? There are other people who will, not, who will say asphalt pavement. See, this wearing surface, what we are talking about, the pavements we are looking at essentially have failed in rutting because the base and the sub-base have failed. Water infiltration. So our objective is to stabilize these two with some sort of cement use of pozzolanic material. The asphalt wearing surface that Patisa we are talking about, there are several ways to do it. One is, which is common in the US, is you essentially scrape off the entire wearing surface and you take it to a hot or a cold recycling plant. Both options are there well, whichever one works. There are other people who propose that you remove all of it except maybe an inch or so. And the other inch should be incorporated into the full depth reclamation when you pulverize the material. So I think it depends on the site that you have. And if asphalt and all this VG, as you know, is done primarily through lab testing that you incorporate and see, is there going to be any value of taking some asphalt and including it in the base and some base when it is pulverized. Any comments or questions, Patisab, on that? Thank you, Dr. Anjad. Thank you. Dr. Sohail Kibriya, Sohail Kibriya has raised his hand. Maybe he has a question. So, Sohail Kibriya. Yeah. Uh, it is very interesting always to listen to Dr. Butalia. You see, uh, expressing his thoughts with fluency. I always enjoy his lectures whether here at this forum or at any other forum. Uh, Dr. Vidalia, it is interesting to see that whereas the strengths of uh, combination of fly ash and lime are com comparable uh, to the strength when cement is added, uh, what would you say about the rate of gain of this strength in the two cases? Right. So uh, that's a good question. Uh, if you look at uh, the section five, we were using five percent lime kiln dust, which is not pure lime, and five percent fly ash. The second section is using four percent lime because the equivalent we were looking at is about one point two five. But we wanted to increase the fly ash amount to six percent. We believe that this station five, station six mix is a superior mix and has more pozzolanic materials than station five. Now, if I go and look at both of these in this figure, there we go, in terms of strength development, if you see uh, what is happening is that the LKD and fly ash, in fact, to begin with, this gray bar that we have is giving, uh, which is going to be at three weeks, gives you much higher modulus than this value. In fact, continues up till about 
and you're talking about rate of strength development, continues up till about seven months. This white line, I'm now going here, right? Again, this is higher for S5. However, after that, after about seven months, if you see this black line, they are both similar. And they seem to cycle the same way. Although over long term, our observation is that the, in the short term, the LKD and fly ash seem to perform better. But over the longer term, the lime and fly ash section strength, I should say not strength, stiffness development performs better. We, did, we have done strength tests, but for asphalt pavements, as you know, stiffness is the governing factor for rutting. But that is how performance failure will happen in the wearing surface. So we were not as concerned about strength as much as stiffness, because even before the structural failure would happen at the pavement, the rutting would become so much that the pavement would go out of performance and would need to be uh, had some intervention. Any comments, thoughts, Vijay Suhilsa? Sir, thank you. This is a very good elaboration. Uh, I was just thinking that when we talk of strength and we talk of stiffness, you see, um, wouldn't you say that uh, stiffness is uh, in a way related to strength, you see, although it is related to load and deformation both at the same time, that for a particular load or pressure, what is the deformation? A stronger medium would be stiffer and uh, vice versa. What would you say, sir, on this? Sure, sure. Uh, I think what you are saying is yes and no. When you are looking at a concrete pavement, absolutely, what is going to govern the failure or the fatigue of this pavement and its cracking is going to be the strength. That's when cracking is going to happen. However, an asphalt pavement, and this is structural, so we are talking about a structural failure for a concrete pavement. That's right, strength is what governs that way. Asphalt concrete pavements to fail structurally, the strength has to be overcome. However, before that can be done, the stiffness reduces so much that this particular layer has rutting in it. As a result, traffic that goes over it is bouncing, boom, 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 boom. So the pavement has already failed, not from a structural perspective, but a performance perspective because the stiffness has reduced significantly and is no more serviceable. So you don't have to wait for the strength also to degrade because it cannot be used as a road. To, and as I think I showed in one of these, there we go. This pavement here that I showed here, let me come back here. The rutting depth, there we go. The rutting one, here we go. This pavement here has not, this asphalt pavement has not structurally failed. Structurally, its strength is still there, but in terms of performance, its rut depth, has so significantly been increased that from a performance perspective, so my point is, from a performance perspective, yes, stiffness governs many, many cases, whereas from a structural failure, uh, the strength does. So I think we, we both are speaking of two different sides of the same coin, and the two are related to each other. Comments, questions, Viji? So, Elsa? Uh, quite, quite right, sir. Uh, it is... Uh, quite uh, clearly explained because when we talk of stiffness the element of deformation also comes into play in addition to the strength it is not the strength alone you are quite right because <laughs> if uh, there is structural failure yeah strength and if the uh, the performance the deformation or the you know a kind of settlement or rutting or whatever you call it yes you're right sir thanks you can go ahead with your lecture now, please. Thank, Thank you. you. And Patisa, I will come to your comment uh, a little bit later, but let me get on the next part of the presentation and I'll hurry up a bit here. The, these are several mine retribution projects that we recently have begun with. And you can see they began in 2010. The first one was looking to use FGD gypsum, about half a million tons at an active and abandoned coal mine combination. The one that we have been most involved in facility five, which is Conesville High Wall Declamation Project, in which we have currently placed over a million and a half tons of stabilized FGD material, FGD gypsum and fly ash, which were fresh materials. And then we also have the Gavin Acid Mine Drainage Project. Uh, the overall objective is now to use high volume, not low volume, high volume utilization of FGD materials, both sulfide and sulfate, 
for reclamation in a manner that is technically sound, is beneficial to environment, public health and safety, and has to be economically viable. So these projects are in vicinity of the power plants where these materials are produced. And we have several studies that we have done. And the one that I want to go to is uh, the Coneswell project. This is currently ongoing. As I said, we have completely reclaimed this site, but this is phase one, phase two. We are currently already on to phase three of the project. The essence of this is we want, this is the abandoned high wall. This is where the mine overburden pile is. We are trying to encapsulate our CCR material in a low permeability fixated stabilized FGD material. That was the, remember the very first project I showed you. Uh, so we're trying to encapsulate it and then it's like a burrito, right? You see paratha banaya, charo taraf to see band kita hai, the under to see sabzi paai hai, alu paai hai, unu to see khaar. That's a cross section. But yabhi anu samay lagda, har ek chiz paratha de saab na lohe, yas anu samay lag jandhi ikal. Teji, this is the burrito type of design. Mostly in the US, really reclamation work on that, that is done uh, using uh, grasses. We wanted to have instead pre planting. So we have these on top of these were mine spoiled, and then trees were planted at the top. Uh, about 80% of the project is done, and I'll give you an update on further work that is done. This is the actual construction. This is the FGD material being placed, the FGD material compact over here. And this is almost up to the grade level. It's almost to the high wall level. Uh, we have significant, this site uh, is one that has been monitored by the utility for over 20 years. And so this, this was our project. We are looking at upstream and downstream water quality, surface water quality, all the combinations that we have. And so this talks about work we do pre-reclamation, during site preparation, and the actual reclamation work, including water quality. This gives you some numbers that were there. Uh, we have not seen any significant changes initially. However, after some time, we saw the water quality change. And now when the water quality changes, the question is, why is it changing? There are two reasons why water quality can change. One is that the hydrology, because we are, okay, here we go, because there's a low probability material here now, the water that previously here could come out has to find some other way around, right? So the hydrogeology of the site is going to change. What this means is there might be new materials which are toxic that this material comes in contact with, which it was not available before. So whether we use any kind of, whether we use clay or anything else for reclamation, that hydrogeology will happen. And the second is it's happening because the water is coming in contact with the CCR material. So we had to make a distinction. We knew the water quality would change. So on the basis of that, we in fact did a detailed geochemical analysis. And that showed us that in fact, the water quality that is changing at the site is not occurring because the water is coming in contact with the CCR material. It's because of the hydrological conditions at the site. It's because of the reclamation process. Even if we use clay material, we would still have this change in water quality. On the basis of this, we have now, we've usually had every month, we are now down to quarterly sampling. The US Department of Interior Office of Surface Mining is currently rulemaking and we are the primary university with which they are consulting on you know, how much water quality monitoring, how often, which particular elements need to be done, when and where. Uh, I am going to skip this except show you uh, what we have is a bent scale model. This is essentially uh, an inside 45 feet long, 15 feet wide and 15 feet high uh, plexiglass. It is a one inch thick plexiglass in which we can do bent scale testing and shows you the monitoring devices. We can introduce water from here. We have different ports. We collect water. We can instrument this. So I just wanted to, since I mentioned the bent scale testing, I want to show that. But what I really want to go to now is our current project that we have with the US Department of Interior. And I'll spend the last few minutes and then we have some time open for larger discussion. We have now, as I said in earlier lecture, moved from fresh materials to landfill materials. This particular project is now looking at mine reclamation. Unlike the previous three that I showed you, this is looking at harvesting ash from a closed out ash pond 
and FGD material from a landfill that has already been closed and using it for high volume surface mine reclamation. And the objective is to save cost effective closure. The two things, we're killing two birds with one stone. We are emptying out an ash pond cost effectively and recycling the material. And we are emptying out the landfill because the FGD landfill gives us the stabilized FGD material. And this is the fill material. So we are doing clean closure of both an old landfill and an ash impoundment and using them to reclaim. Because of economic reasons, we are focusing this only within 25 miles radius of FGD landfill and or a coal ash plant uh, upon. But that is where it is most cost effective. And we have a GIS study we've done that shows there's enough capacity to be able to do that. These are some of our tasks we're looking at lab and men's scale testing. Uh, demonstration project is currently going on. The power plant, which this was going on, shut down two years ago. So this particular DOE project, which is looking at an adjacent ash pond and old landfill, is a blessing to be able to do. We are doing quite a bit of risk analysis now in mathematical modeling, and you're looking at some GIS data set. This kind of gives you, you know, who our partners are, our funders. We all, none of these projects have one agency. There are always multiple agencies who kind of work together. And so here is what I'll close with this kind of gives you that the industrial partners do the construction costs. The research costs are the state agency that provide to us. We have several examples here. And uh, this all pretty much happens within the coal combustion products program. I have the privilege of being its director since 1997. It has been fully funded for the last 25 years. So this allows us to plan for future projects. At the university, we work closely with the Office of the Energy and the environment and some other research interests that I have are in liquefaction potential of ponded fly ash, looking at shale and gas pipelines, uh, with drill cuttings, general soil mechanics, geotechnical foundation engineering, and have also some interest in composite laminates. And so with this, I will end. And I think Tahir Saab mentioned this at the beginning that I've been involved with over 50 research projects, totaling over 30 million in the last three decades. So with that, I will pause and uh, there are some questions and I will let Tahir Saab uh, take the charge from me. Someone What's is showing the screen, I think that needs to change. Your share screen is... Uh... Somebody is showing share screen, that's not me. Yeah. Oh. Who is that? <laughs> Someone is still sharing the screen. <laughs> Nadeem Khwaja is still sharing his or her screen. Nadeem Khwaja, can you please stop sharing screen? Can you please stop? <laughs> <laughs> Nadeem Khwaja, can you please stop sharing your screen? Phone karo bhai usko. I think the organizer can turn that off, screen sharing. I'm trying, I'm trying to do so. In the meantime, Patti Saab had uh, another question. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Uh, if you can read the question, Dr. Saab, yes. please go ahead with that. Yes. I, the, I just, I, I, have, I have succeeded in uh, stopping that share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question by Patti Saab Latif is, can we have temperature-related linearity parameters in case improvised AC pavement, stress on rheology. Uh, VG, it is my understanding that temperature effects generally are non-linear. That is the place I would begin and then lab testing, I would, uh, uh, I prove myself wrong, but my initial, I would be reluctant to assume that initially they would be linear. Uh, any comments or questions, uh, Patisa, from you? VG, you are muted. Haji. Thank you so much. But Sir, I think you are muted. If you want to say something, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, <laughs> uh, to I mean to I mean further to it, Doctor Batalia. Uh, my uh, my I mean my question is that. Uh, how the upper limit, upper temperature limits? They are here in Pakistan. We encounter around 135, around 135 degree Fahrenheit in the summer, 
and uh, when the this become the binder become non non linear uh, well, I mean, recently even in us and canada you have been facing uh, these issues uh, because of high temperatures some of the payment binder have i mean, I mean uh, uh, performed non non linearly so how yeah. about your research on it are you doing something about it avirji uh, anjali you you rightfully have pointed out that uh, because of climate change we are seeing more variations in terms of too hot and too cold and i was looking at the data that we had and when we looked at freeze thaw cycling we were looking at minus 12 degree centigrade up to 54 degree centigrade i sorry i i only have it in centigrade here but i think you are right that as more climate change happens we and this would only be for the us and the region that i am in so i think this has to be local jimmy to see care and as these temperatures change i agree we as engineers need to be able to do more tests especially because we i am quite convinced they will be non linear would you agree with me that virji that this research would be non linear so once once it becomes that our your our binder become non linear then i mean it will accelerate rating indefinitely that's, that's right so this is a good example which of how you say that how climate change how it is impacting a field of civil engineering where materials uh, are now exposed to more extreme temperatures both in the freezing as well as in the higher both high and low temperature this so previously it was this now it has become this and as a result we need to be able to look out i think that's a very good point and more research on thank you so much ji gentlemen if anybody has more question please you are free to ask though i have now only left around 3 to 4 minutes more so please any questions come up now ji udaya akram saab you can go ahead Uh, hello i i don't have a question i just want to add that uh, it was a pleasure listening to dr batalia it uh, i mean very well explained very comprehensive very well presented the presentation was extremely helpful and uh, uh, just to thank you thank you so much you welcome azir saab de munu munu ta allah ta da hasa sun ke munu hasa re as nahi sir aisi gal nahi hove entertainment aagi na thodi ji te fer Yes, yes. <laughs> Tell the boy, yes, sir. Yes, yes. So here you can go ahead. Uh, I wonder, uh, just had a dose. Ne, can they ne? Pehli dafa ho ya? Zara bacha ke rehna bhi. Aso badiya chiza me kya dafa ho jadi hai na? Zara the annal next time. Acha, I, Doctor Batali sir, Punjabi chiz sawal karna. Thoda jab Punjabi the session bhi chalna chahiye the akhiri chiz. Bilkul. there are people on facebook also so here so we have to uh... okay so i i revert to english again uh, dr patalia it is interesting uh, to see uh, using different materials and uh, to obtain a kind of strength gain and uh, stiffness gain you see different materials in different proportions and things like that uh, what would you think that what is the practice in usa or in your observation of mixing these material thoroughly in the field practice how they are mixed properly i mean fly ash and lime in with soil or cement with soil what is the practice you, you see and also in your observation in your research do you, i think it lot depends on the contractor and the specifications that we write and how they are enforced and qa and qc testing and if the right combination of all of these would work well but sometimes the challenge as you know is that in the field uh, qa is a big challenge and sometimes the the place where i think things go wrong is when you start trusting people and say okay we ek theek kar de but one constantly has to verify to make sure the mixing the materials handling is the bane of every construction project haan ji so that is always a concern that we have that is by working with good contractors who have a field record and who have a reputation who which cannot be spoiled i think is the key issue but i think you did it, everything can be designed very well if there is not proper construction and oversight qa and qc it can result in uneven mixing and then you have certain areas that are very low strength others are very high strength of stiffness and that's trouble 
in any project. So the uniformity and homogeneity here of construction uh, is a significant issue. And so we need to work more with construction engineers to be able to be assured that what is designed is what is being constructed or is what is being constructed. You know, for example, you know, we talked about this earlier about compaction of uh, clay, right? We know that we know in the field because of the way we do in the field, we'll never get a sample with standard proctor compaction as much in the field as we get in the lab. So there, we use a factor of safety of ten to account for that. So, so you're right, Vijay. Thanks, thanks, Doctor. Do you have any more questions? Ijaz Ali has one question. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, Ijaz Ali has a question. Ji. Go ahead, Ijaz Ali. Why don't you ask your question verbally? Ijaz, sir, would you like to ask your question through the microphone? Chori, I read the question. I can read it. And if we are using BBR or RV or DSR testing on binders to check its properties for four different temperatures, do we have tests set up to check the as for mixes of different temperatures? Uh, don't worry, Kendi, he doesn't have a uh, microphone. That's fine, Ji. Ji, my expertise is that is not in asphalt. So I would invite if, you know, we all have certain expertise where I'm not an expert, I will, it is too dangerous. Is there anybody here? Uh, who is an expert in asphalt who can help answer that question? Ijaz Alida? We are all concrete people, huh? Uh, I think we have few asphalt people, but uh, maybe, uh, anyhow, any more Sorry, questions? I don't have an answer for you, Mirai, you have expertise in here, So thank you very much, Dr. Bataria. We are we are almost now uh, uh, finished with the time. And uh, thank you very much. Today, I just want to make one comment that I feel I felt myself at a disadvantageous position being a host. I could not uh, uh, pay full attention to the lecture. It was such a nice lecture. Now, believe me, I will be seeing it again on YouTube. A uh, uh, host is always a, at a disadvantageous position because the responsibilities, other responsibilities do not let the host uh, listen to everything uh, with full focus. Anyhow, if you, you, are, you are assuming that your wife will give you that time this evening. I don't think that is going to happen. <laughs> it is Ramadan here. So, Ramadan is very much in the world. time is here. The Maji of Pakistan, I see you, Udo Mabri Dostan, and Northern areas Giasi, the Mavi, which you Rosera Casey, the Machidi Rosara Casi, Pura Chidi Rosara Casi, man. You look at the other thing. They deep are May October, yeah, October show conference are ye, Vigi, December, Udi announcement card, October, the December conference are ye up near UD. Nay, oh, Sidi Kasak, the Yasis of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers, the Gardia. So let me make the announcement for the next lecture. It, it is going to take place on 14th May. The topic is how Norway has reduced car traffic in major cities. Our speaker is engineer Binish Shahzadi, head of road department, Wiken County, Norway. That would be on 14th May and uh, the registrations will start uh, from tomorrow. Uh, the CPD certificates, uh, all participants can collect from the 20th April, which is Wednesday, from uh, our office, 83M Model Town Extension. From 20th April, your uh, certificates will be ready. Dr. Batalia, your shield and your certificate, inshallah, Sadia will send uh, through the courier mail, and inshallah, you will receive it, receive it within uh, another, let's say, seven to ten days inshallah thank you thank you so much thank you so much to see a program organized for reschedule the lecture he is being very kind and gracious 
ਤੇ ਦਸੰਬਰ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਉਦੋਂ ਆਪਾਂ ਮਿਲਾਂਗੇ ਜੀ ਫੇਸ ਟੂ ਫੇਸ ਲਾਈਵ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਡੂ ਡ੍ਰੌਪ ਅਸ ਅ ਲਾਈਨ ਬਿਫੋਰ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਕਮਿੰਗ ਸੋ ਥੈਟ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਰੈਡੀ ਟੂ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਯੂ ਹੀਅਰ ਐਂਡ ਹੈਵ ਅਨਦਰ ਅਨਦਰ ਸਿਟਿੰਗ ਵਿਦ ਯੂ ਜੀ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਵੀ ਜੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਮਿਹਰਬਾਨੀ ਆ ਮਿਸ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਬਟਾਲੀਆ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਵੈਰੀ ਮਚ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਆਨਰਡ ਟੂ ਹੈਵ ਯੂ ਹੀਅਰ and and for delivering such a marvelous knowledgeable lecture ji thank you very much allah bless you all and i'll see you on 20th april ji allah hafiz ji thank you very much sir <clears throat>